And thank you for joining us here on PM Express. I want to take a break from all the terrible things happening in the economy, as we discussed yesterday, and focus on football, something that unites us. But of course, in the last uh, few days, is you know, let a few of us with heart aches and pain. But it is a symptom of a bigger, bigger issue, right? And, and we want to look at that because there is something of an African curse each time we go to the World Cup. We now have only one African team left standing in this particular World Cup, gone to the uh, quarterfinals. I'm talking about Morocco, and we need to applaud them for, for doing it. But it is just another example of what could have been. African teams consistently underperform at the World Cup. And as you begin to uh, appreciate what I'm about to show you, and we've gone into the bit of the data as far as the World Cup is concerned, to show you a trend, a trend of consistent poor performance by African teams at the World Cup. What really is the problem? I mean, Morocco has gone through, we applaud them, but there's three African countries have done it before them, and they don't go beyond the quarterfinals. And the history and the data is anything to go by. It predicts that Morocco will be knocked out in the quarterfinals after they've succeeded in the round of 16. So what really is the problem? And the Black Stars, yes, I know you want to want to talk about the Black Stars. I mean, it happened on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Many of us have moved on. And so I really don't want to give too much attention to the Black Stars, but I will. And then I'll look at the bigger picture because we are part of this continent. And when we go, we, we all cheer uh, the rest of Africa when we play. And we consistently, as a group, as a continent, underperform. It, it, is, it is no fluke. We need to look at that. And so we'll do that. So let's start with the Black Star, shall we? But of course, that's where this is, this is our home. So let's start here and then we'll open up to the continent. You know, we know that we've exited group stage. Uh, we finished last bottom of our group, which again is no surprise to many people. And we did a bit of the line graph to show you what's been happening since we went to the World Cup in 26, 2006. And if you look at the, what the line is telling us, what, what the graph here is telling us, we peaked in 2010, and we've been on a downward trajectory ever since. If anything at all, we've just plateaued from 2014, the last time we went, to now. So we are, we're doing poorly, really, because we were here in 2006 when we, you know, went to the round of 16, first time we went, right? And then the next time we went in 2010, the best performance yet, we went to the quarterfinals. And you will think... That at least if you cannot beat this, you know, don't drag it down. And so at least maintain this status quo, which was really a good one. And then the next time we went shambolic, group stage, bottom of the, of the, of the pile, and we're out. Come back to 2022, again, we've shambolic again, we're out. And so this line doesn't tell a good story, right? And on the average, 2012 World Cup, was the poorest in terms of performance that we've seen, by the way. It, 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 we'll, we'll come to why we say that in terms of the real numbers um, for, for you to appreciate. And then you look at the performance of the 2022 World Cup. This, this is the, the pure data. We played three games. Our win percentage is 33.33%. <laughs> we, our loss percentage is 66%. You don't need a scientist to tell you that's, that's really, really poor. We scored five goals and we conceded seven. And you begin to see why in terms of goals conceded, this is our worst World Cup. That tells you something. We scored a lot of goals and the, this 2022 World Cup is, is, is tied with what we also witnessed before this. And this is what I was, I'm, I'm indicating here. So 20, 2006, we played four matches, we scored four goals. Now, if you look at 2010, we played five matches and scored five goals. So if you look at it, 2022 is the year we've scored the most goals. We played the least amount of games with the most goals, right? Which is what you see here in blue. So as far as goals are concerned, this is our best World Cup. That is the only positive out of this. But the reverse is also true. As far as conceded is concerned, this is our worst World Cup. We've conceded seven. Never before have we done that in the, in the four times we've been to the World Cup. 
In 2006, four games concede six. We score four. So we are not high scorers of the World Cup traditionally. 2010, our best. Five matches played, five goals, one goal per game, right? And yet, we went farthest. And then we concede four. So 2010, if you look at it, goals scored, goals conceded best. Best. And then you come to 2014, play two, play three, score uh, four, concede six. And then you come to this year where we scored a lot, played you know, less games, three games, but concede a lot. So that tells you something about the quality of the defense we, we had going into this. And I had a lot of the experts on the show when I did a show before we went to the World Cup say they really love our defense. In fact, they criticized our attack and said the attack, you know, you know it's, it's poor. This is the poorest attack we've had going into the World Cup. The defense going into the World Cup from the pundits, they claimed our defense was better this time than before with a poor attack. But the data shows us that our defense leaked a lot more and the upfront we scored a bit more playing three games. So that should tell us a story. This is what you do post-match, post-tournament, to look at where you should improve going forward. We're trying to do that for you with, with this. And then you come to the, some of the things we need to be looking at. Now that we are out, we spent money for the three games. If you look at the budget that was presented to the parliament, we spent $8.1 million for the three games. Yes, $8.1 million for the three games. If you add the friendly matches that we played where we spent 1.5 million, then we spent a total of $9.6 million to prepare and to play three games in the World Cup, okay? This is just pure data and facts, right? And you're, we, we're doing this so you can, you can just begin to analyze yourself, cost benefit um, of, of going to the World Cup at the time of an economic crisis. Now, if you look at income, as I, I use income advisedly because FIFA is gonna give us something back, okay? So if we, we qualified, so we're entitled to $1.5 million, in the group stage, we get $9 million. So in total, we are expecting from FIFA $10.5 million. If you did the calculation, we have a net income, a net income, I mean, call it profit, whatever, a net profit of just $800,000, um, you know, dollars, which, which, is, which isn't bad, which, which isn't bad, right? I mean, so, so that, that's it here. So we net profit. So if you net it off, we, we, we are not in a negative at all. So yeah, it's not bad. We have something small to show for it. I mean, that could go into doing other things. So which, is, which isn't bad at all um, for, for the purposes of participating in the World Cup. Um, but then again, if you look at both sides of the equation, money well spent. I'll ask my pandas when they join me, money well spent, considering that FIFA is going to give us some money. And if you net it off, we have a net um, income there. And there we come to the man Otoado. And I have to say a lot about this. And my pandas will tell me what they make of him. Going into the worker, I did a show here today, and all of them agreed he is a man to lead. But the dust and the rubble he's left in his wake with his pronouncements after he's left, right after we lost, have left me doubting if we made a good decision in appointing him. Of course, we are all wiser after the fact, but yes, that's why we take decisions and we use um, when, when we know better to make decisions going forward. So what are we learning from this? Otoado came in, played 12 matches. His win percentage is 33.33%. Won four matches. He drew three of them. So draw percentage is he's drawn well, 22% of, of the time that he's played. And he's lost 44%. Five matches he's, he's lost. I mean, so this isn't a great record by any standard where your win percentage is only 33%. And your win is, your, your win percentage is only 33%. And your defeats you've suffered is up to 44% with 22% draw. So if you put this and this together, that is significant. Out of the 12 matches played, he's only won four. So clearly, losing him or him resigning shouldn't be something we should cry about. Because the evidence says 
He's been poor. He's been poor. This is even less than average. Less than average. So that is the data. So don't, don't cry about him. But the thing that I would cry about, if you have this poor record coaching the Black Stars with the sort of players you have, I, have, I mean, you know, all these things, converting players, converting to the national team, and you come and produce this for us. And then you leave and begin to say stuff like this. Resign straight after. You know, when you are the only part-time coach in the World Cup and, and, and tell us stuff like this. The decision, in essence, that everybody knew I was going to leave. You know, and then he, this is the part. They released me for six months. I mean, I wonder. My panelists will tell me, did we know this before? Because when I, I had that show, I didn't get an impression. I thought he had left. Um, or, well, maybe I misread it. But he was telling us that, after all, he, he just had um, leave of absence. Was it leave without pay, whatever it is? Six months. He was given six months to go and coach and come back. Really? How do you have a part-time coach who, has, who is away from his permanent job, six months, whose mind is on Germany, well, don't take my word for it. Listen to what he says. At the moment, me and my family see our future in Germany. And like my role, and I like my role at Dortmund, and we are very happy there. The reverse is true. He doesn't like his role with the Black Stars. That's, that's a fact. I like my role at Dortmund. So he doesn't like his role at the Black Stars. And then he says, and we are very happy there. He's not happy in Ghana. So at the moment, me and my family, we see our future in Germany. He doesn't see his future here. Shortly after he led us to a shambolic performance and an exit, he's telling you all along his future is there, not here. And then he goes on. From the day I started, I said, if I qualified, I'll resign after the World Cup. Even if we are champions, really? I, I don't believe this. Okay, we'll come to the thing. And then you have Chris Hooting as his assistant. But if you look at the data here, the data that we pulled up from all the sources we can find tells you that if you're really scrutinizing this closely, maybe we made a mistake not giving it to Chris and giving it to the part-time coach. Forget about the opinions. Just look at the data, right? Years of experience. This is nothing. Nothing. Ten years, right? Games played, 12, 499. He was an assistant for a national team as well, by the way. Wins, four. Wins, 195. Okay. Loss, five. Uh, you know, one nine, you know. Draws, three. One, six, five. I mean, and, but this is the thing that for me is interesting. If you net it off, win percentage, they are not too far apart, right? So maybe he's also an average coach. But the experience is heavily in his favor heavily in his favor and we made a decision to go with Otoado the part-time coach who says his future is in Germany and that's where he's, he likes that role he doesn't like it. so why did he accept the job why did he accept the job when he liked that role better than what he had and he's happy in Germany not in Ghana and his wife and his family they, they, they see their future then why did he accept that role in the first place those questions we need to ask. And, and I think the GFA need to admit that they got this one wrong. This when it was the appointment, they said, no matrai makwe. But honestly, on the evidence, this is matrai makwe. The man himself was doing matrai makwe. He was trying it to quit for six months. If he succeeds, maybe he will stay if he's that he will go back. That is the evidence. That is the evidence. He was doing matrai makwe. When the GFA boss is saying, this appointment, we don't want to do matrai makwe. Okay. And then what else did we find in terms of data? Let's look at the big picture, the Africa story. Because let's forget about the Black Stars for, for a minute. Because the Black Stars story is not, it's, it's not an isolated one. The rest of the continent go to the World Cup to just add up to the numbers. Don't take my word. Data. Data. Look at it. So African teams have been to the World Cup a few times, right? And their performances we've tried to find. Cameroon, Tunisia, Senegal, Morocco, Ghana. They are the ones who went to the 2022 World Cup. So this 2022, I'll come back to the history of the World Cup pretty shortly. Group stage, 
How many of them, all of them, with the exception of Morocco, knocked out? Knocked out. Win percentage. African teams, pay attention, 33, 33. Morocco, of course, Morocco is, is doing well. Senegal, yeah, 50%. So the best performing African team is, is Morocco, and it's doing well. We need to applaud them. So they almost appear to be in the 2022 World Cup. They are an outlier, so you take them out of the equation. The vast majority of the, of the four, 33, 33, 33, 50. The best is an average one, right, which is Senegal, Ghana. This tells you a story. The trend here, it is no fluke that we are shambolic as an African team. Point four, four, three. Ghana. And you see, out of the African teams that went to the World Cup, we were the crappiest in terms of points on the board. Right? And then we have goal difference minus, minus two. Again, tells a story. Again, if you come to the World Cup, now let's look at the bigger picture. Let's look at the African teams, African nations at the World Cup in this history. Nations in Africa, 54 of them, only 13 have been to the World Cup. Only 13. Now, out of that 13, 41 have never participated. So a lot of them are still trying to qualify for the next World Cup. But this is the story of our performance at the World Cup as a continent. And it is dipping. Group stages, that's all we go to do. We go there, drum and dance in the group stages. And then we are out. Round of 16, only 8 have been there. Only four quarterfinals, in addition, if we, if we add Morocco today, four. Before Morocco, only three. Beyond this, zero and zero. So history, this graph here we've drawn, tells us that Morocco won't make it. But I hope that for once, we'll break this chain so Morocco goes, right? But if you ask the North American, North, North Africans, they, see themselves, they, sometimes they don't even see themselves as Africa. But, but that's a whole different conversation for another time. This is the data of our performance at the World Cup as Africa. It is terrible. Why? I don't know. My pundits will tell me. Why is this the case? In the history, in the long history of the World Cup, why? And another thing that beats me, the European teams, they have black players leading the attack. Didier Drogba, Abedi Pele, all those fantastic players. Right? And yet we go to the World Cup and we can't perform. What is it about it? It's just kicking the ball. It's just round ball, chasing and running and kicking it. Why can't we do it? Even here. Okay. And then you look at the probability of the we do the probability question, which is which is a very important one. Probability of being at the World Cup and exiting, if you look at from 1930 to now, since we first went. At the group stages, that's where we have the most probability in terms of our performance and participation, 77%. What is the probability that we would only, we would, we would go to the round of 16? Only 16.67% probability that African teams will go to round of 16. That is shambolic. To quarterfinals, only 6% probability that we'll go to quarterfinals. As for semifinals, and it's zero, zero probability that we'll go there. So Morocco is up against it, right, again. And if you look at African nations at the World Cup, we look at the story of the individual numbers, which is just reflecting what the probability conversation we've had. It is, as you've had it, four only in quarterfinals, including Morocco, zero going forward. So my guests are joining me. Sunny Dara knows football better than I have, better than I do. And my colleague, George Ado Jr., will also join me. Songo. Fire for Fire is here on the show tonight. I want him to help me here from the Black Stars first. We'll do the first 15 minutes or so on the Black Stars. And then next, next round of it, we'll talk about how the Black Stars is just, you know, an isolated element in the bigger picture of African poor performance at the World Cup. Stay with me. Don't go anywhere. Let's look at the numbers. Let's talk. Let's use the data to analyze what happened at the World Cup. I know the emotions are also very high, but let's stay with the facts for a second when we return.
Ibrahim Sanidara uh, used to uh, work for the GFA as the uh, Director of Communications and also does a lot of work for CAF as well. Uh, George Ado Jr. has been in Qatar uh, for us uh, and joins us on Zoom uh, right now. Uh, it, it, let me start with you, uh, Sunny. So the Black Stars have been a disaster waiting to happen. We're just finding out now, of course, now that they are gone. Do you agree with that assessment? Especially when you have the part-time coach going into the game. Uh, pl please um, unmute. Please unmute for me. Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, I disagree with you completely that it it was a disaster in waiting, or it is a disaster in waiting, or the squad is a disaster in waiting. I think that we've seen um, the future of Ghana football unfold in a way that a lot of people least expected, and that um, a squad that has been assembled. Um, just in two months' time, wouldn't be expected to, you know, fly out of the blocks the way you would expect a squad, for instance, against Uruguay that has been together for more than 14 years. It's, it, it will be an unfair analogy uh, to come to the conclusion that it's a disaster. I think that um, Coach Otoado has bequeathed Ghana a, a future squad possibly that can conquer the continent and also be world title challengers uh, for the next 10 to 12 years. Because if you consider the fact that most of the players in the squad are in their early 20s, we can get the better part of 10 to 12 years from them. That is three World Cups from them. And if this experience they've had is anything to go by, by the next time they play at the World Cup, in between which they would have played two African Cup of Nations tournaments, and in between which a lot of the players would move to bigger teams where they would have bigger, bigger experiences, it will have a trickle-down effect on the Black Stars that would make us the, the future title contenders. So if you rely on the data that you've just been churning out, you'd be doing a grave injustice to the realities on the ground on, uh, in, in football. If you rely on such raw data without the background, without the history, without the, the connections, that would make a good team. It would be an injustice. Okay. Jo George, you agree? Yes, I perfectly agree. Because uh, I, was, I, was, I was watching closely um, when you were going through the data, and I thought I could try and explain a bit in terms of what you've got on, on the data. So it is clear that the 2010 World Cup and 2006 World Cup are our best World Cups. That's for fact. We are not able to interpret properly what happened in 2014 because of the many issues around it and that the team were not in the right frame of mind. So it's easier for us to do the comparison with the World Cups that we have gone where we had no pressures on our mind. Let me, let me just make a quick point here that at the World Cups that we did very well, or at the competitions that we went and did so well, there was a certain carefully plotted attempt and also great space for the players who went to the competition to know each other and to play for some time before they got there. That's why in my view, I think that this World Cup came a bit too soon for the squad. Let me take you to 2006. In 2006, about eight members, or I mean close to nine members of the squad that went to Germany were members of Ghana's 2001 under 20 side. The likes of Dirk Boateng, Suleiman Tari, Razak Bimpong, um, Michael Asian, John Mensah, John Pencil, Emmanuel uh, um, Papo were all members of that squad. Think about it. A squad that played in 2001 and won silver in Argentina stayed together, went through the ranks, and were at the 2006 World, Park, World Cup. They had additions like Otuado and, and the likes, you know, just to make it a, a team. But if you look at the, 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 the main work of the team, and I'll take the game against Czech Republic, when we surprised the world, there were six of them in that game. So it should tell you that there was a period of putting them together before they went to the World Cup. When you take the 2010 one, it's even more interesting because those who participated in the 2006 World Cup about 40% of them were in the World Cup in, in South Africa. Then we went for the 2009 
and the 20 World Cup winning team used them to play in the Chan tournament. Many forget that Milovan Ryabat was in charge of the Chan, where we were second. In, uh, again, we, we lost the game against DR Congo after beating them the first game. And then that same crop, because of injuries in the AFCON 2010, were used in that competition. We went all the way to the final and lost to Egypt. That was the nucleus of the team that went to 2010. So experience in, 20, in 2006, plus the young ones who had two tournament experiences, and then one or two who had come, like Kevin Prince, Wati and Co, to join the squad, went in 2010 and did what they did. Actually, on paper, 2014 was supposed to be the best squad ever because we had rolled over from 2006, 2010, and 2014, but they had issues, so we don't touch them. This particular squad we are talking about actually has come about after... Ghana messed up in the Africa Cup of Nations. You look at the space between March and now, this is all they have got. The funny thing about this squad is, one, they didn't have enough time because a lot of cancellations came about. So even the time they were going to use to play Af Af Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers were cancelled. All they had was um, one Africa Cup of Nations or two Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers against Madagascar and Central African Republic. They went to the Kerin Cup where they didn't have their key players. And then they played friendlies against Nicaragua, Brazil, and, um, and Switzerland. It is only at the Switzerland game where we could say that the team had the full complement to do something. And so going into the competition, it did not lie that Ghana was the lowest ranked team, number one. It did not lie that Ghana had the most inexperienced team because we had only two members of the squad, the 26, who made it into, or who had played the World Cup before, in Jordan and Dede Ayu. So the stats were very, very clear that we were not supposed to be over expectant. In any case, this squad did better than 2014 because they won a game against South Korea. And the last time Ghana won a game at the competition was far back in 2010 against Serbia. These are the facts. So if you look at the analysis, it is, it is for me to tell you that this squad is, is at the beginning stage of the 206 or the 2010 squad. And we must allow them to roll. So it's very, very easy for people to wake up and say, this was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong, without looking at the analysis. Let me just add a little bit to the Coach Otuado, Chris Houston bit, yeah. uh, just before you go. Now, remember yeah. that Coach Otuado, remember that Coach Otuado and, 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 and the likes were, um, were actually appointed at a period where there was very little time to study a team and turn over. This is why the, the, the Coach Otuado option for me from the FA did make a bit of sense. Because Coach Otado played with the Black Stars in 2006. He was a scout for the Black Stars in the 2014 um, World Cup, 2010 World Cup. And had also said as an assistant coach. Yeah, in, I mean, he has said as an assistant but, coach for but, Milovan Ryabat before. Just hold on. Yeah. Go. Like he had also said as an assistant coach with um, Milovan Ryabat before he was given the, the job to do. So I would imagine that the plan was Otuado, because he knows the boys, leads the charge, and then when he's done, um, Chris Hilton takes over. I think that is actually the plan. And if that plan is working, based on what I've seen from the technical team, it is now so much easier for Chris Hilton with the information that he has had to take control if he's given the yeah, job. But, but, but John, so, let me ask you, yeah. did, did, did we know all along that um, Otuado only had six months to come and try <laughs> this out and return? It, yeah. it was a clear fact. Okay. It was clear. You remember, and, and, you remember that. You remember that. You remember that when we qualified for um, the uh, the World Cup, President Akufuado himself said, in, in when he was he was talking about it, when he was happy talking about the excitement and all, he said that he would want to talk to Dotcom to keep you here for the World Cup. So he actually could have left after the qualifier. Truly. Yeah. I mean, so, had to be so, another negotiation. So, to have so, so, on so Sunny, let me bring Sunny. So you're saying, Sunny, that you accept his his words shortly after we lost that. Yeah, me and my family, our future is in Germany. That is, that, is the, that, that is the job I feel comfortable with that I want to return to. Shortly after we've lost, you accept those pronouncements he made when he was exiting? Well, we, we already knew that he was leaving after the World Cup. It's, it's no news. Yeah, I, yeah um, we, okay, so, so but, but then he says to you, he's almost robbing it, right? Yeah, I mean, I've always seen Germany as where my future is. And I'm going back to my job, and that's what I really want to do. Well, that is the truth, uh, Evans. That is the truth. Mm. This point was known well ahead of time. 
And it made sense, like George explained, it made sense that in between the time of us qualifying and finding a new coach to start a new project, you, the coach search process will, might take you three months. How long would it take for the coach to come in and settle down and then take you to the World Cup? It makes sense, or it made sense then that um, somebody who knows the team inside out stays in charge until after the World Cup. And, and mind you, like George stated, this is a guy who's known the team from day one. Since 2006, he's been part of the Black Stars team. As yeah. a player, as a scout, in between that, he was working for European clubs. Yeah, but, but Basani, Basani, you know yeah. football. Football, it's a results game. So what you're suggesting is this is a, our best bet. So he's known the players. If he's known the players all along, why the shambolic outcome? After another shambolic performance at, at the Africa Cup of Nations, that clearly is but unacceptable. No, no, no. Now I can explain. Now I can get to explain. Now, um, you can imagine that the squad we took to the AFCON is totally different from what we had, we, we had uh, at the World Cup. Now, that squad that played at the AFCON has been massively improved by what Otto put together in two months. So you can see the job he has done in putting together this squad of players, play, new players like Muhammad Salisu, um, Salis, Halidu, all of those players that the country has seen for the first time. Mm. It's Otoado that has put them together. So we should actually be hailing him for bringing us the new generation of players that will drive us forward. Not those that bombed us out of the African Cup of Nations against an island like Comoros. So we, we have to appreciate the fact of where he li he's lifted the team from to even be able to beat the almighty star-studded Nigeria to take them, to take us to the World Cup and now to get us the firm base for us to, to, to move forward um, in world football. We are just coming off the match against uh, between Portugal and Switzerland. Weren't you proud when we beat Switzerland by two goals to nil? I mean, that, that was a friendly. Of course. It counts. It, 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 counts, for, it counts for absolutely nothing. When that was preparation for the World Cup, you go to the Cup, you go to the yeah. World Cup, and then the Switzerland that like you beat that you should celebrate goes to the <laughs> round of 16. It counts for absolutely nothing. It's a preseason. No, I'm, I'm Manchester United, so I can tell you this for free. We, they say we are pre-season champions. When the season starts, we are nowhere to be found. What, what, what? It doesn't mean anything. Now, no, that tells you that if Switzerland had a 6-1 a hiding a few moments ago, and we were putting Portugal, a young team, most of them in their early 20s, were putting Portugal on the edge, it must tell you that we were not as pushovers as um, you, we, you, we put you we put Portugal on the edge. It was three one. A it, it was what? It, wasn't it? It was three two. Three two. Yeah, it was three. It was three two. Yeah, but but that they were begging. They were begging for the match to come to an end. No, 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 no. That's not, that's, that's not the same game I want. That, that that is the Portugal team in that no, in I, that I, game. I, well, second, Portugal no, team Evan, in that in Evan, that first match. Uh, George, George, second. Portugal yeah. team in that first match. That was struggling, yes, but yes, still beat us. They were the poorest in that first game. All the games they played, that was the poorest they've been. And yet they beat you. I no, mean, no, 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 two, no, 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 three, no, no, no. They were not the poorest. We made them look poor. The poorest really? of the black okay. stars made them let, look let me, let, let me ask. Let me ask a more substantive question. And Najiman, Coach Najiman will join me shortly. And this is you, George. You, you made an argument. Now, yeah, I mean, we couldn't have appointed anybody else. And uh, Otoado, the part-time coach, who really isn't a coach, he's a scout. I mean, was the best, you know. He's a coach. He's a coach. Okay, I... I he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a U-team coach. Okay. He's a U... I'll grant you that. He's a U-team coach. He hasn't coached any... He hasn't let coached me, any... Let me stop you there quickly. Let me stop you there quickly. Uh-huh. Um, in most European settings, before you even become a scout, you need to be a coach first. 
And secondly, let me point it out to you yeah. that he was the assistant coach for Norgeland for three years yeah. before he went to um, uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. Yeah. And then from there, Borussia Dortmund recruited him. Yeah, but... So we, we should stop, you know, okay. catching him as, a, you know, a scout. Okay, but, but, no, but, but, the, but it's a fact that he's a scout. It's a fact. He's a scout. And he's a... He's, He's a scout. He's a, he's a talent scout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, a, so he's a scout. I mean, I mean, fact. He's, he's, he's a no, scout. No, no, no. He's a coach. He's a coach. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. He's he, got the UEFA license. Yes. He's only a... Yes. The, the top level. He's, he's, only, he's only a license, so he qualifies him as a coach. But me and you know in football, me and you know in football, it's about the experience. It counts for a lot. And, and he comes, he came to us. The best he's done, as you said, He's an assistant to some Midland, and then he's a scout. But let me ask no, a let, let, let me let, let me let me ask a more fundamental question to George. George, you made the argument that because of the time we had, it was a short time, and so we have to appoint him because he's been there. You know. Morocco, the team that is in the only African team to proceed, to progress, appointed their coach on the thirty first of August, twenty twenty two, two months to the World Cup. And yeah. he's done okay. the magic. So that argument clearly doesn't can I, fly. Can I help you? Yeah, but can I help you with the argument? Because that's not where you have to start from. No, but that, you that's your argument. From. Your hold argument on. was... Let me help you. We, we didn't have you. a choice yeah, because know, he's the best. We could have hold found on. a coach hold on. in August. Okay, okay. So, that, so hold on, hold on. The point is, Coach Otoado um, was initially appointed for that crucial World Cup qualifier against Nigeria. And that was only weeks after the Africa Cup of Nations. In fact, the draw for the World Cup qualifier was done at the Africa Cup of Nations. So you have to take the time between when the Africa Cup of Nations was over and when you had to play a World Cup qualifier. That's the beginning of all of this. At that stage, you needed somebody who definitely understand, understood the team because you have let off Milovan Rajevac. And the only one close there was a man who had assisted Milovan Rajevac. No, but, so but remember that, but that, but that, that argument, when he, but, so but hold that on, argument. Evans, Evans, there are first things. First things. No, first but, things but, that, but that, but so that, he... now, now, yeah, so now we have the facts. Now we have the facts. We have the facts, right? Yeah, I'm but... saying, I'm saying the facts doesn't support the analysis that, yeah, he's the guy, he's been there. I but, was giving you, but, but what other, I was saying other was, teams, yeah, Evans, other, other Evans, countries. What I was saying, you have used, you have used the coach who was, who was, a, who was appointed in yeah. August and played the World Cup in November. How many months is that? I mean, August, and I'm telling you that, September, October, and I'm telling you that the first, November. yes, and I'm telling you that the first, yes, and I'm telling you that the first appointment of Otuado, which began everything, happened weeks after the Africa Cup of Nations. If you can understand that, without the World Cup qualifier, you are not in the World Cup. If you don't win a World Cup qualifier, you don't even get to be in the World Cup. It's the first thing we have to understand. Now, within that space of two weeks, the FA. Uh, the sports ministry had to go for somebody who understood the team right off then. That is a different thing. If Ghana yeah. decided that after qualifying for the World Cup, we wanted to go for Chris Hutton, that was a different option. Yeah, but, but, a different but thing. Clear, clear, the evidence says about, we should have wait, probably done wait, that. Wait. It's important, yeah, wait, but it's important that you note that the appointment of Otoado started weeks after the Africa Cup of Nations because there was the, uh, the World Cup qualifier against Nigeria. That is where it started from. Then when he qualified to the World Cup, they decided to keep him on and go. If you make it look like it was like the Raguri situation where he was brought in after the team had already qualified for the World Cup, it's, it's, yeah, they also okay. could have decided to take okay. a decision let, to have gone there. Let, let, but, let me, but just be fair to the facts. At the time when Otu was appointed, no, my, my, my argument, had very little time for that. No, my, my question is, after he qualified, after we played the Nigeria match, we had enough okay, time. You are saying, we, have, we had enough okay. time to appoint to be a, a better guy like Morocco. We had enough time to appoint a, a coach who had no who, who didn't have a divided attention like he clearly did have okay. and has expressed same after he exited right. it, it, just stay with me okay, for a so second jo, just a second because i have nanajiman who is joining me i want to bring him into the conversation hello nanajiman coach thank you for joining us on pm express uh, yeah good good evening to all of you good evening to all of you yeah so so coach i i, I we started off by pointing out that uh, otoado and this black star squad have been pretty symbolic of this World Cup and that possibly it was a disaster waiting to happen considering his own pronouncements after we exited that his mind was always on you know Dortmund 
and Germany was a place that he, 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 he believes his home is. And, and the reverse, as I argued, may be true. He didn't really see this job as a one that was permanent. It, was that a disaster waiting to happen, considering the facts that we now know? Of course, we are wiser now, but we should have seen this coming, should we not? Well, we were wiser then, um, because basically we knew from the beginning that this was like a side job. It was something he was doing on the side because his focus was always on his full-time job at Borussia Dortmund. Um, I think prior to his appointment, I came on your show along with Sani, where we talked about who should be appointed. And I talked about, I talked about Herb Renard and the fact that we should really go for him. I remember. Despite, despite the fact that he was talking about 120 US dollars per month, I said we get away with giving him a thousand and it would. Oh, for, forgive me. Um, I, we're having a challenge with the audio, um, Nanajiman coach. Let, let's see if we can rectify. So, sorry. Yes. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Yes. I, I'm. I'm saying. I'm saying that we knew we were wiser before because we all knew that this was a side job for Coach Otoada. This was something he was doing on the side. His focus was always going to be on Borussia, Borussia Dortmund, and he made that quite clear. The, the fact that he was a talent uh, scout or whatever, we also knew. I sat on the same program with Sani Dara where we talked about that too. I also pushed the the notion that what we should do is is call her Van Up, um, Renard because he is someone who had experience with Ghana and we've seen what he'd done with Zambia and Morocco and, 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 and all these things. And, and basically there was an issue about his salary being 120,000 US dollars. I said that I felt that we could pay him $100,000 and he would accept it and it would be worth the money. Um, that was rejected and we went in for Otoadu, knowing full well that his mind wasn't on the job. We went in for a collection, a conglomerate, if you like, of coaches. George Boateng, Chris Hewton, um, and, and coach Otto himself. Now, the thing about it was this, is that Chris Hewton is qualified far and way above uh, coach Otto. Way above, because Sunny talks about him having an A license. Yes, um, um, Chris Hewton has had a pro license for a very long time, and he has coached top clubs in the Premiership, etc., etc. We should have really appointed him since we weren't going to appoint uh, Renard. But we went with we went with Otto because he was more easier to handle. He was someone who couldn't put his foot down in the way that perhaps Herve Renard would have done in terms of player selection, for example, uh, and, and player selection in particular on the day of matches too. And so we went for that option because we've got, a, we've got a GFA who always wants to be in a position to influence our coaches when it comes to selection. Mm. When they... When they had Milo, when they had Milo, and Milo came, it was a similar thing. And, and Milo has echoed these things about interference. CK has come and echoed the same thing about interference. We've had four coaches now within three years for our senior national team. And I came on your show and I said that no serious country, no serious football association will employ a coach on a part-time basis to manage a senior national team. The senior national team represents the jewel in our country's crown. That's what it actually represents. And I said, no one who's serious would do that. They did that. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, yes, it was shambolic, but there were things about his work that I liked because we played we played Brazil. We got 3-0. That was no big deal. Yeah. It could have been... It's Brazil. 
They are number one. What do you expect? Yeah. We should lose Brazil. But Nicaragua, I don't even know why we played them anyway. They were 60, they were 60 places below us, and we played them, and we struggled to get that through. But then when we played Switzerland a few days before the World Cup, I felt that this man has got a handle on things because I didn't expect us to beat Switzerland by two goals to nil. They were ranked 15th and the performance was much better. Yeah. They looked like cohesion, a little bit more telepathy uh, and, you know, and stuff like that. And, and I felt, well... I can see some change here. I can see some difference here. When we went into the Portugal game and we started with like eight defenders, if you include the goalkeeper, I thought, no. We had Kudos and, and, and Dede along with um, Inaki Williams. And I thought, no. And we all saw that it didn't go down very well. Yeah, and, and, that's and, then, and, and then we repeated it in the last game. We, after that second game had proven that you don't change your winning, that team was a winning team and somehow we changed it. Yeah, you never change your winning team unless there's an injury. And that formation that we had set up was a formation that allowed players to express themselves. Mm. This, this 5-4-1 uh, didn't allow us to express ourselves at all. It basically set us up to fail. The Portugal, Portugal match, we were set up to fail by our coach. We lost that game on the bench. On the bench, yeah. And and and, 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 and South Korea, that was one from the bench because he allowed everyone to express themselves. Yeah. Of course, the laps and we conceded a couple of, of goals, and they were good goals. And I think sometimes yeah, and, we have. And and we and, and, and then I demand. And then, Ajman, you say, you say, and I want to quickly, because I have just a minute to wrap up, unfortunately, and, 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 and I'm grateful that you could join us even on short notice. But very quickly to uh, Sunny. Sunny, so that's where we are. Where do we go from here? He's left in his wake. We've seen the rubble. He's left. Do we get um, Chris Hooting in on simply change the entire team and get somebody else? Or what, what's, your, what's your take on way forward very briefly? Please unmute for me. Sorry. Yes. I think the backroom staff is, is intact. I don't know if they are leaving, but if they are staying, I think it's it's a good goal. Uh, we should find a, substance, a substantive coach that would stay in charge for, for a very long time to help the team grow. And I can see a situation where the squad will grow, evolve, and more intelligent players will come into play. Remember this name. First time you are hearing this name anywhere in Ghana. There's a name called Ibrahim Osman. He scored a hat trick today against Nice in a friendly match. Remember this name. Okay. Um, Three, and... four years later, we'll come to him. He might be our solution. He okay. will be the next Asamwajan. I say this for certainty. Okay. Injury. Let's just pray that he's injury free okay. and this could be him and Nyama would be the future of the Black Stars added to the likes of Kudus, Kudus Kamal, and, and others. Yeah. I mean, Nanajiman, what, what's the way forward here very briefly for me? You know, I, I, I want to touch on what Sani said because it's very important. Because in my analysis of the whole thing, the team that we have at the moment, we've done very little in, in nurturing their development. Yes. You know, uh, the, the, the Kamaldins, the Soas, the Majid Waris, the blah, blah. They've all come from academy that decided that they wouldn't participate in any Ghana Football Association competition. Right? And they have, these are now the people we are calling their names. It's just the same as the Wafa Academy. We've had Harrison Affel, who's been there for a long time. Even uh, Salisu has come from there. We didn't, we, we didn't nurture any of these players. And it's fine saying, let's look to a player who's just scored a hat-trick. But if we're really serious about what we're doing, we will nurture players here. We will develop players here. The players that we're depending on, we have nothing to do with their development at all. We just go there and persuade them, come and play for Ghana because your chances of playing for France or wherever may not be that good. That needs to change. 
that really needs to change. You look at what Morocco did to, uh, tonight, it's not by chance. Go to Morocco and go and have a look at the facilities that they have there yeah. and compare and compare it to what we have in Pram Pram, which is Ibas, a... Ibas, but, quickly, quickly, not to interrupt um, Nana, uh, Coach... Well, have, well, have. <laughs> coach as well. But quickly, <laughs> let me just state that, you see, there's one thing that we, we are quick to say, go to Morocco. And I've been to Morocco. This year alone, I've been to Morocco yeah. seven times at the invitation of their FA. Now, one thing I can tell you is that the amount of money they are sinking into football development, the, the football center alone on the edges of Saleh costs them $100 million. Yeah, and there's something And they've got such mini facilities across the country. Uh, Fuzi Lekja, the FA president, says they have got about... Um, 70 fully fledged stadiums yeah. in the country. He says it's not enough. Now that tells a story. As a I country, can't... if we want to go into proper football development, we should be able to spend. Yeah, we need to invest. I saw you put, 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 putting together that um, amount we spent at the World Cup and what the income is. Yeah. That that expenditure is, a drop. is what X people. People yeah. think you are spending. I mean, and, and unfortunately, of, 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 because of time, we need to wrap up. But Najim, I'm grateful. Asani, thank you very much. Also, we definitely need to return to this when the World Cup is over. Then we can do a proper analysis of the African problem. We'll return to that because that's a bigger one. And as you've seen, some other countries are trying to invest, but even that still struggle when it meets others on the wall so what really is it then we can put that in the bigger context of the ghana problem as well and maybe find a solution to it Joe the rest of evening